the premises of the presentation of the film itself. So we talk about the way the staging defeats on the film, uh, on the battlefield, can transform uh, itself, can transform itself, and this thanks to the magic of cinema, into an exemplary moral victory. And I give some I give some examples of the way this operation, that is this transfiguration of defeat into victory, can be carried out. So and I remind you that we already had a glimpse on on that, on this operation, as we talked about the films on Chinese boxing. That is we saw how um, uh, Valian Kung Fu Master uh, can restore the dignity of the humiliated people he belongs to by defeating the Japanese karate champion or a brutal British boxer. But what I would like to show is that this is only one example among many others of the narrative, which is a very eclectic narrative, a narrative procedure, which makes it possible to depict a disastrous uh, event as a glorious accomplishment or as a deed of valor. The straight, but okay, it's certainly much more than a trick. Uh, it's a rhetoric gesture. We found the streak is not only an issue for filmic or cinematographic narration. You can easily find it also uh, in literature, in novels. It is a gesture which is deeply rooted in historical narration in general, as history as a narrative is narrowly related to political and collective memory issues or stakes. For our general purpose, this uh, issue, this question is important. First, it draws our attention on the powers, let's say, of cinema as an industry whose vocation is to manufacture narratives. Cinema has improved this gesture and made it extremely efficient, very impressive. And this, of course, for the good reason that the narratives, cinema, movies, manufacture, reach a vast audience. They are addressed to the mass in general as general public, let's say. And second, this efficiency, uh, the efficiency of this operation shows how strong the, the pact, uh, yeah, or contract, the pact is, which links together movie, that is movie making, and collective memory, or with collective memory. It, enhances the political dimension of cinema. A battle which has been lost on the field can be won some months later, as we will see in with the Wake Island, but as well some years or even some centuries later. And this on hundreds of screens. And this is a very important trump. Uh, in the hands of the rulers, as the rulers are more or less related to the industry of cinema. They, the rulers, resort to it very often, and this in order to rally uh, and to cheer the population after a defeat or after a setback. And I will give some examples of that. So from this point of view, cinema can be defined as 
uh, some kind of a narrative court of appeal. Uh, that is, um, it gives to the past, to facts, past facts, a second chance. It's like a second trial. For if you succeed in convincing the audience, that is public, which is made uh, basically of citizens, citizens or subjects, uh, that a devastating defeat harbors. If you can convince this public that even the devastating defeat can harbor the promise of a coming victory, of course, if you can do that, uh, you already have made a great step in the direction of this victory. And this is exactly, I will try to show it, this is exactly what films like they were, ex sorry, expendable, not expandable, expendable, uh, or Wake Island, uh, Air Force, we already, I think, saw some clips of it, Destination, Tokyo, do or try to achieve. I will not show clips from all these things. I will only show, choose a few of them. So, and this is, it's just, I'm just saying this as a joke. It's a figure, a rhetoric figure you can meditate about. If you have lost a battle, maybe in your personal life, you can make a film out of it, for it is a providential, it can be a providential opportunity for you to transfigure this defeat into a dazzling victory. Okay, so I take my first example, Wake Island. Wake Island, which is not at all for the, the least, for the least, it's not at all a good film. It's a uh, very too quickly shot, watched up. Um, and there's a few months, uh, and this is the interesting thing at it, just a few months, only a few months after the events it is based on took place. So it's about the story of the US military garrison on Wake Island, which was for the American army an outlying post in the Pacific. And it's a film on the onslaught by the Japanese Navy, by the Japanese troops, just after surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. So the onslaught, the Japanese attack on this island just after Pearl Harbor. You will see in the opening credits uh, that uh, in this picture, you will read in these credits that, I quote, in this picture, the action at Wake Island has been recorded as accurately as possible, end quote. And then you see the credits uh, mentioning all kinds of marine corps and military advisors whose participation is, of course, for the audience at the time the film was released, the guarantors of the authenticity of the film. But if you look more, more closely at the film and at the available documentation, you will see that this, what the credits say, is not exactly the truth. It's not the whole truth. For at the end of the film, which I will show you, the end of the film shows how the defenders fight to the last man, to their last drop of blood. Actually, in fact, the real ending of the battle was a bit less uh, sublime and glorious. In reality, uh, the U.S. garrison had to surrender, and this after repelling the first wave 
of the Japanese catastrophe. In the film, you will also see how the garrison's naval commander dies of wounds, but we know that, in fact, the commander, uh, Cunningham, survived this battle and even survived the war. Okay, uh, of course, only fanatics whose brain is fucked by militarist education and propaganda can be convinced that surrendering and surviving under such circumstances is shameful and dishonorable. So this kind of fanatics we often see uh, as Japanese characters uh, in American films, but sometimes in Japanese films too. So the problem for our topic is uh, evidently not at all that the garrison surrendered and that its commander survived as the film denies it. What is interesting for us, for our purpose, is actually the way free hand is given to the filmmaker so far as the so-called recording of the fact is concerned. And this provided he, I mean the director, the filmmaker, fulfills the implicit, his implicit contract, I mean with the production on one hand and with the public on the other that is preparing a film which is fitted to galvanize, to mobilize the audience at the time that the US Navy and Army are on the defensive in the Pacific. In such conditions, facts have to be, let's say, taken into consideration by the filmmaker only roughly, very roughly the end of the story can be transformed. And this in such a way that this defeat, that is this capitulation of the garrison, of the American garrison, can be kept in memory, because this is what matters, be kept in memory by the American public as a glorious feat of arms. And this, of course, before all. This is what has to be printed in the collective memory of, let's say, collective consciousness of this public. What matters is that this event can be placed under the sign of the slogan which appears with the closing credits. This is not, this is not the end. And that it can be depicted in a dynamic perspective as an incident which instead of being a bad omen, boosts the nation's uh, and the armed force determination to pull themselves together. This dialectic model is at work the same way in all the American films which depict the Japanese victories in the Philippines and having which have to deal with uh, General MacArthur uh, retreat to Australia uh, and which constantly point up his famous phrase will or I will I shall I shall come back I shall come back or we shall come back a dialectic narrative takes shape in which the defeat is just a moment a moment a phase in a general process which has to be victorious. It has to be victorious. And the defeat is just the negative moment of this general positive process. Okay, these are things I think which are familiar to most of us. So what we should take seriously into consideration at this place is rather this, I would say. As it deals with history, cinema, movie making in general, is endowed with such a narrative power, with such an impact, it has such an impact on the community of the living, that is, by community of the living, I mean the 
people, nation, a group of persons in general, or today, actually, uh, a world uh, audience. Such an impact, such a narrative power, that it is that it not only outdoes all the rival narratives, literature, etc., but that it tends to manufacture some kind of an, I would say, alternative reality. That is a new real, a new real, which is virtually more real than the real itself. And as I mentioned about Wake Island, a new reality that has not much in common, in some respects, not much in common with what reality, with what really happened in the past. But never mind, for the American families who saw the film in 1942, uh, and, okay, uh, the documentation says, reminds us that this film was one of the biggest hits in this year in the United States. So for these American families, it was the film, Wake Island, was actually the real and genuine recording of what happened, of what happened on Wake Island as the Japanese went to the offensive. So this unlimited capacity of filmic narration to manufacture a second reality, which for those who are captured, captured by it, bear the mark of truth and authenticity, it is not only what makes it possible to convert a defeat into a victory, it is also what makes, I would say that the temptation of manipulation of the audience, of the masses, this temptation constantly holds cinema as an industry, as a power, and as a media. This narrative power of cinema as a collective device or as a collective apparatus that is, as I always repeat, I insist on this, a machinery which is intended for manufacturing stories. So this is the reason why, of course, why authoritarian or totalitarian regimes have seen in the past, as is seen cinema, movie making, as a providential political tool. And we have to remember at this place what Hannah Arendt says about what is the specific for totalitarian regimes as uh, what we can call logocracies, that is powers um, um, based on logos, that is language powers based on language. So totalitarian regimes as logocracies. That is, these regimes have the capacity to transform, to transfigure any fact. And what Arendt generally means are facts from the past, historical facts. But you know, you certainly have read uh, always um, classical novel that is simple as simple fact as uh, uh, not two 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 plus two uh, four so transform this the capacity to transform this into a pure opinion that is something which can be changed which can be changed according to let's say relations of strength so which can be an opinion which can, which can be replaced by another opinion, more powerful, more legitimate, or more authorized at, let's say, another time in another sequence. And as we know, examples of that kind, uh, exactly the same kind of, it is not an exaggeration, I mean, examples of that kind uh, can be found easily, uh, massively, for example, in Soviet history, uh, as history, I mean history as 
narrative, uh, and this uh, specifically at the time of Stalin. That is the true, true, uh, so true, that's official history of Russian Revolution, as it is told to children, let's say the uh, 30s, 40s of last century, is varying, constantly varying, according to political circumstances. And you see how in this narrative, leaders of the first rank, uh, who took first, first place in the Russian Revolution, uh, but who after that have been the victims of political purges, like of, of Trotsky first, this kind of people, of figure, disappear, disappear from the history textbooks and disappear as well of official photos. So it means that the past becomes an occasion for the totalitarian regime to demonstrate that his power in general, and specifically his power on narratives, has no limit at all. And that reality, past reality, is not a limit uh, to its power on narratives. That means, very simply, that the past can be constantly reinvented, reinvented, rewritten, anytime, anyway. So, of course, there is a limit to what I'm saying here. Uh, I do not want to say at all that cinema taken into consideration as a power. Uh, since cinema is sharing with the totalitarian regimes this capacity to reinvent, to reinvent the past, that cinema could be or should be for this reason defined as a totalitarian art. This is not at all what I mean, of course. But what I just want to recall in this place is that the fantastic entertainer cinema is, I mean, from the angle of mass culture. Also, this entertainer is also at the same time a very powerful political narrator. And this, notably, as far as historical facts from the past are concerned. <laughs> okay, now we can see the, it's a big, yes, just the, the beginning, the, that is the credits from uh, Wake Island, because the credits are very interesting, and, uh, and then the end of the uh, So, okay, the only concession they make is that the names have been changed, but it's not exactly like that, not only the names have been changed. So now we see the end, that is the, the battle at the end. It's just at the moment that we see the planes. planes Japanese planes come, it starts there, yeah. the planes come. We see the planes on the horizon line. And this. So you see it's like uh, some kind of a leaflet which has been hastily written. And just even Okay, so I pass to my second example, which is a Japanese film, um, which uh, strangely has different titles in English, two titles in English. The Oba, the Last Samurai, is one of the titles, but there is another one, which is End of War. Okay. The film uh, by Hideyuki Hirayama, and it was released uh, in 2011. So it is the story of a group of Japanese soldiers who continue uh, to fight, refuse to surrender, and this on the island of Saipa. And this long after the Japanese high command has laid down his arms. And they continue to fight, this group of soldiers continue to fight, even for weeks 
after the capitulation of Japan and after the famous emperor's speech. It's a desperate but stubborn resistance which is led to the bitter end by an infantry captain called Oba, who is a very clever tactician and who for this reason has been nicknamed by the US soldiers the Fox. The battle for Saipan. This battle is well known. And it's not only because it was very bitter fought, very desperate and bloody, but also because this island, Saipan, is one of the places with Okinawa where local civilians have been forced by the Japanese army to commit suicide rather than falling into the hands of the Americans. And I will show you next time, not this time because we have uh, technical problems, I will show you a clip from level five which is a film by the French director Ismarca. It's called Level 5. In the, it's a French title to Level 5. And this clip in Level 5 is very explicit and illuminating on this question of collective suicide in Saipan. But OK, we will see it at uh, the beginning of the uh, our next uh, course. So, end of war mentions this episode of the people jumping from the cliffs, but just by passing. And the film begins with a description of the last ditch battle fought by the Japanese infantry on the island, which was some sort of a desperate banzai attack and which took place on the 7th of July, 44. About uh, 4,000 Japanese soldiers and 2,000 American soldiers died on this occasion. And after that, Oba, as a survivor, uh, built up uh, again a small band of soldiers, uh, 46 men. This soldiers withdraw to the mountains, jungle, uh, and they caught up with a group of Japanese civilians who were hiding in the forest and this for fear of being taken prisoners by the Americans. In spite of the lack of food, of medicine, of everything, Obama and his men still continue to harass the American garrison on Saipan. Uh, this stubborn resistance lasts for 512 days after the battle for Saipan has been fought and lost by the Japanese army. Oba and his troops surrender, and as you will see in the clip I will show, in a very formal and pompous way uh, on the 1st of December 1905, that is three months after the capitulation of Japan. So this film reconstructs Oba's resistance as an epic and with the most emphatic tone. And this without any reservation about the character of Oba, Oba's character and about uh, the, the meaning of his action. His bravery, his stamina, his modesty make of him a hero who, in general conditions, which are those feet, and Saipan was the turning point in the war, who brilliantly transfigures the rule, it was the rule for the Japanese army, into a moral victory. The character of a man with an inflexible will, an unyielding sense of honor, unfailing faithfulness to his country, 
to his people to the emperor of Rome. The very clever, very interesting for our purpose, very clever narrative device of trick in the film consists in presenting Obama through the eyes, letting us see, say, Obama through the eyes of his adversaries, of his enemies. And this notably an American captain who has a link to Japan because he has been living in Japan, he speaks Japanese, he's fascinated by Japanese culture, and he makes, for, this reason, for these reasons, all his efforts to try to understand what Obama's way of thinking and motivations are. And actually, he, or this uh, American captain, admires very much Obama. So bit by bit, as the narration develops itself, Obama becomes an exemplary resistant. He becomes a stoic figure, and as you will see at the end, the surrender ceremony is his apotheosis, the crowning moment of glory uh, of this exemplary soul. Now, the glorification of Oba in the context where the film has been shot is not exactly innocent. For it erases, it strikes off the critic of militarist, militarist blindness, which nourished the kind, this kind of hardline hard attitude in the Japanese army at the end of the war in the Pacific. The critic which many Japanese films echo and make their own from the 60s to the 90s of last century. Some of these films have been already mentioned in different presentations we have, and we will see some of them later. So this film restores the traditional discourse on values like honor, fidelity, endurance, obedience, devotion which actually is nothing but the old militaristic stance. This, I would say, hastily updated. It goes, the film, this film, goes very far in this direction, making, for example, the American captain praise Obama for having, quote, protected the Japanese civilians who had to live with his group in makeshift camps in the mountains. Uh, and this uh, for not. But we can ask ourselves if the civilians, maybe the civilians, so including women, children, if they were not maybe rather human shields for Oba and his men, and how could they be convinced not to rejoin the camps where other Japanese civilians have been taken uh, charge by the American army or maybe the Red Cross? And this, uh, how to keep these people in the mountains with Obas troops without making them believe that the Americans would torture them, cut them into pieces, which was an open lie and uh, the Japanese soldiers knew it. How many of these people have died of starvation or lack of medical care in these mountain camps as some sort of hostages of Obama's sense of honor? Quote. So this film draws our attention on the very, let's say, plastic, and variable character of narratives on such issues, and this in the space of filmmaking. For we know that in other times, and not so far away, I would say, in the past, in other times, under different 
conditions, and specifically political conditions. Oba would have been portrayed by other filmmakers as a fanatic, blinded by his devotion to the emperor, blinded by a detestable notion of what his duty was, and maybe by his relentless hate for Americans as what? Well. How could have been depicted he could in this film that's her hand? Of course, what I remind him from the 60s, 70s, Japanese, Japanese films from the 60s or 70s, the last century. So he would have been in this film, he would have been depicted uh, as as the kind of hysterical warrior whose bellicose mood provided at that time their best arguments to those in the American camp advocated the atomic bombing of uh, Japanese cities. But, and this is what we have to think about, very distinctly, times have changed. And I, as I will try to show another time, this film is in Japan, among many others, the harbinger of a new revisionist tone and mood, which proliferates in the Japanese cinematography, which deals with this issue that is end uh, of uh, war. So, the end uh, of uh, of uh, the last samurai shows how strong. And this is a more general remark. Uh, how strong the power of attraction of a movie and cinema in general as an art and as a manufacturing plant for narratives can be. The politically very obvious message of the film is conveyed by exalting positive values and gallant behaviors such as stamina, loyalty, devotion to others, patience, endurance, etc. Oba in the film is a very humane hero. He's not so much, I would say, a man of exception as an ordinary man, but who has, been, who has to face great challenges and is forced by the circumstances to be up to them. This is the reason why we, we ordinary people, we, the ordinary audience, we are inclined to identify ourselves with him. He becomes, for all of us, a moral model, and we forget that, uh, by the same token, we forget that his moral values are completely perverted by a militarist ideology whose most common horizon is death sacrifice, conquest, extreme violence. Boba's high moral quality and personal value in this film is a decoy, a decoy intended for erasing the memory of one of the most salient crimes of the Japanese army at the end of the war, that is the forced suicide of civilians, including women and children, based and see this uh, forced suicide based on the description of the American soldiers as devils, as barbarians who rape, who maim and torture the local population wherever, wherever they land and conquer. Saipan before Okinawa is notoriously one of the places where this criminal hardline attitude from the, the Imperial Army was put into practice at the detriment of the local civilian population. Some of these people being Japanese, but some of them were not ethnic Japanese. Maybe this has to be taken in consideration too. The invocation of tradition, that is of traditional values, as the title, one of the titles shows Obama as the last samurai. This invocation of tradition is intended at this place for restoring in the present, that is in our present, 
that's the, the reason why this is our concern too, of course. Restoring the lost honor of Japanese nationalism. By extolling Obas Banyan patriotism and devotion to the Emperor, the film tries hard to erase any critique of the form of militarism and spirit of conquest, which led to a disaster. And it's not only for the Japanese people, but for all the people of the Pacific region. And this message, or this lesson about the past, he, the director of the film, the director of the film, he promotes it very efficiently. And I will say almost with with some kind of a pattern. You will see this. So, at this place, and keeping an eye on our subject, that is cinema and war, cinema and collective memory, cinema and political stakes of the on, uh, and political state of the past in the present, I would be inclined, inclined to say, beware, beware of the attraction, or maybe even seduction, powers of cinema. That is, let us learn the art of standing back in facing such a thing. Let's learn how to stand back, to stand back, to keep away from that kind of narrative which is saturated with ideology, but which is, on the other hand, very attractive for the good reason that it presents itself as not political at all, not political at all, just dealing with human and moral issues. So I would say let's learn this the art of detachment. Uh, yeah, now we can see we can see the okay. yes. So it is the end of the film. Um, Oba is negotiating on, you, on the first scene, you will see he's negotiating his surrender um, with uh, the American captain. Uh, you will see something happens, and then we will see the ceremony, which is very so what we have, yes, it begins with the, the jeep which arrives, uh, the American jeep arriving uh, on the place where they will meet.